Hey guys, this is Billy from adultchella.com and today I want to share the three most common bad habits in the bow arm that I see in adult beginners. So what I'm going to do for this video is I'm just going to demonstrate each bad habit playing French folk song from Suzuki Book One. <laughs> And I'm also going to include an exercise you can use to kind of correct that bad habit, okay? What I'd like you to do is watch the video and then if one or more of these habits seems like they may be something you're currently doing, take a video of yourself with your phone and then what's interesting, a lot of times you can actually visually see the bad habits we're going to be talking about as well as hear them. So most of us already know that there's three elements in sound production. There's contact point where you put the bow, there's the speed, and then there's the weight. This is not an incredibly hard thing to understand intellectually, and it's easy to wrap your head around. However, putting it into practice while playing the cello is a totally different ballgame. And why is it so hard to do? Well, as beginners, we're not familiar with playing the cello yet, and our bandwidth is completely full with just the arms and the mechanics of playing let alone being able to listen to the sound we're actually making. So the great thing about today's topic is that by working on your bow arm and improving bad habits, you're inevitably going to really improve the sound you're making. And making a beautiful sound on the cello is like the number one thing you could do to feel motivated to continue practicing and continue moving forward. All right, so let's get started. Number one is too little bow or what I'm going to call hot soup. And the reason I'm saying that is just you have an image of hot soup really hot and you're going to take just a little bit of the soup in the spoon, blow on it forever, you sip a tiny bit, it still burns, and then you do that and it's going to take you, you know, 20,000 years to finish that bowl of soup. Okay, so what does this look and sound like? Basically, we're using very limited amounts of bow and the sound is going to be kind of stuck sounding and in if we think of the sound as a ribbon, the ribbon is very narrow and it's kind of pressed and there's just no air or freedom in the sound at all, okay? Or in the movement, it almost looks like you're playing inside a telephone booth. You know, the arms stay at the sides, they're not really moving out, you're never fully extending either arm very much, it's just everything is very, very compact. So there are probably a lot of reasons why this would happen, but what I think why that's happening is basically we're just very conscientious adult learners we want to do everything right and we're so fixated on keeping the bow parallel to the bridge and not having a scratchy sound and not having the bow skid out from moving it too quickly that we just sort of kind of close in on ourselves and try to control every little bit. So as a solution to this what I'd like to do is offer up an image and that's the image of petting a dog. Okay. So I, I use this with my students a lot. So if you think about when you're petting a dog, you're going to do it with your whole arm because you don't want to startle the dog and just like slap your hand down. And generally when you pet a dog, you make contact with the fur. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever analyzed this deeply when you pet dogs, but you kind of contact with the fur and then with your whole arm, you sort of sink in weight with your hand. Good boy, you know, so you kind of like sink in weight and speed your hand up and the whole arm is kind of extending naturally and you're kind of like pushing through the dog's fur. That's kind of what I'd like to do with the bow. So if you're feeling kind of very stuck, so we're going to take the bow. You can even start from the air if you want a little bit and just kind of make contact with the string. And so I'm deliberately starting with very, very slow speed very light, just, I don't want to start all the dog, remember, and then I'm just going to sink in with weight and speed, and the thing that's going to tell me if I'm doing it right is the sound, okay? So this is where this, the kind of thinking has to turn off, and you're now turning your ears on and listening, okay? So I want, let's, let's listen one more time. feel like hear that ribbon of sound open up but not in a pressed kind of tight way like ah it's just ah and then you can go ahead and release if you want but basically what you're learning to do is to sink in and open sound up with weight and speed it also is teaching you to 
increase the speed and therefore kind of have a more natural motion that's a little less tight and held if you're using if you're already using too little bow. So go ahead, start doing this if you want on each open string. And then you can go ahead and just, you know, play a fingered note later and, and just, it, it'll be a different sensation when you add the left hand. But keep in mind that each string will feel different. So you really have to use your ears and have, have your ears guiding your hand. All right, moving on. Number two is too fast, too furious. Okay, I'm asking you a question. Do you suffer from SCBU? And that is suspiciously consistent bow use, okay? The kind of hallmarks of this bad habit, the bow is just kind of tell visually that it's being kind of thrown back and forth. And whether you cross strings or whether you change and shift into a different position, the bow is just doing its thing. It's not really ever adjusting its speed. As a result, the sound is very inconsistent on the upper strings, a lot of times it'll cause certain notes to just be way too loud for what, what's called in the music. And then as you go to the lower strings, because the bowing is just being completely consistent, it's gonna start getting more and more uh, surfacy and skid, like skidding across the strings because instead of slowing down and sinking in to activate these heavier strings, the bow is just still kind of doing its thing on automatic. So if I had to take a guess as to the number one reason why this, this happens, which I definitely remember doing, as a beginner, you kind of are told to use more bow, usually in reaction to the first bad habit, which is, you know, being a little too timid, a little too cautious. And so you start just thinking, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to use as much bow as, as possible, basically, on each note. And the problem there is that you aren't thinking about those three elements really in terms of contact point, speed, and weight. You're just saying, I'm going to sit down and move the bow. And so it's, it's planned out without considering the string and the feedback you're getting in the moment, whether the string is, is opening up that ribbon of sound or not. So the exercise you can do to kind of work on this um, that I'm going to offer is to work on crescendos and decrescendos with the bow. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a single note and I'm just going to try to start off nice and soft and then with by adjusting speed and weight I'm going to try to grow the sound all the way to the tip and continue then change the bow and continue to have a big sound and then on the way back in on up bow I'm going to start the diminuendo so it goes soft loud 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 back down to soft so it'll look like this <laughs> you can do the reverse as well which is this time I'll start with a big sound and then decrescendo at the tip and then grow it all the way back crescendoing on the up bow. Let's try that. That second way is going to be easier because it's more powerful as you're coming in anyway so it's a natural crescendo that you're going to get but what you're doing here is finally laying claim to speed and weight and controlling the sound on purpose. So that helps you, instead of just having this kind of unconscious bowing motion that you then, you know, put down on the string and start going and start playing, it's teaching you how to grow a sound with more speed, lower it and diminish the sound with less speed. And basically you're taking ownership of the bow stroke instead of just kind of having it on autopilot. And my number three bad habit is one size fits all. So what this looks like and sounds like is, you know, actually on one string, uh, the player will have a pretty good sound going. Uh, really, the, the weight and speed seem, you know, perfect for the contact point. The notes are sounding really well. And then as he or she changes strings, things start to go awry. So most typically in this scenario, you'll see someone playing on one of the top two strings and then as they go down to the lower two strings the bow doesn't make any adjustments and then suddenly again it's just very surfacy and uh, problematic. <laughs> Here, 
there. Hopefully the start sounded okay, not too bad. And then as I switched strings, it just got more and more surfacey because I hadn't adjusted speed and weight in the bow. So why this happens is actually really interesting because I remember having this question. We think about the three elements of sound production, speed, weight, and contact point. And then we kind of set that, <laughs> we set everything up perfectly for one string. And then we forget that every time we change strings, the properties have shifted of the string. And so you have to adjust the weight and speed at least of the bow, maybe even the contact point as well. So the exercise to work on this is actually gonna incorporate the use of a metronome. I'm gonna put the metronome on 60, and then for this purpose, you can play any note, but what I'm gonna do is in first position, I'll just do second finger on C, and I'm gonna play it at 60, and I'm gonna pick a contact point, and I'm gonna to try to make it so that I play mezzo forte, um, nice healthy sound, and I take all two clicks on 60 to get to the tip and then two clicks to get back, so a full bow. Okay, now here's the important part. Then I'm gonna switch to the D string and I'm gonna try to continue line so that I make sure I don't switch contact points, okay? I'm gonna continue on 60, but we'll see. I My guess is I'm not gonna get all the way to the tip because uh, if I do, it's gonna change the dynamics. So I'm trying to match the texture of the sound, the decibel level of the sound, and it's just going to require less and less bow to do that as I go across the strings. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, so we got it on 60. Here we go. As you can see, by the time I got to the G and the C string, I'm using, you know, on the C string, maybe half a bow, if that. So if I used a full bow, there's two options. I'd either have to really sink in, and so it would have been much, much louder than the original sounds I was making. Or if I, you know, just move the bow faster to use a whole bow, it would have completely skidded out. So for this exercise, there's going to be three constants you want to really keep your eye on and your ears on. The first constant is the decibel level. You want to really try to blend the sound as much as possible so that it's not, you know, much louder on one string and much softer on the other string. And then the second constant is going to be the contact point. So you don't want to be moving up and down as you cross the strings. You're just going to go straight across wherever you start. Just go straight across to keep it constant. And the third constant is the metronome. So every two clicks you change the bow. Don't try to get to the tip every time across the strings. The whole point is that as you get lower and lower, you're gonna be using less bow. So there are my three bad habits and exercises to kind of help your way out of them. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to it and giving it a like. And uh, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section below. Thanks so much and I'll see you next week.